Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com. Today we're going to be going over another video from Bobby Fischer for the upcoming graphic novel Bobby Fischer, The Knight Who Killed the Kings. If you guys have any questions, I've been playing some clips before the videos uh, to kind of give you a teaser. But if you have any questions about the graphic novel, it's going to be pretty awesome. Um, I'll be answering a lot of questions you guys have about the graphic novel in the next video. So definitely feel free to add a comment or you can always email me and I will answer your questions in there as well. Today's video is going to be from the first ever U.S. Championship that Bobby Fischer played in. Uh, the championship was 1957-1958. Now Bobby Fischer played in eight different U.S. Championships and he actually won all eight of them. So he's eight for eight. That's not a bad uh, statistic um, if you're looking for a winning streak there. So uh, this was the first championship that Bobby Fischer ever won, so 57-58. And he was 14 years of age. Now when he won, Bobby Fischer became the youngest U.S. champion ever. So um, I don't know if you are 14 or older, uh, but if you can just imagine being 14 and being the best chess player in the United States, uh, that is a huge deal. And Bobby Fischer um, at the time was probably rated about 2,400 to about 2,500. After the tournament, he became an international master. Uh, so kind of give you an idea of you know where he was as far as his... Uh, you know, chess career as far as his chess knowledge. His opponent in the game today, just to kind of give you, um, you know, a brief background, his opponent was Edmar Mednis. Now, at this time, Edmar was about 20 years old when they played. Um, in the eight years that Bobby Fischer played in the U.S. Championships, there were only three people that beat him, which is pretty amazing that for eight years that he played only three people actually beat him in a game. Now Bobby Fischer would win the entire tournament but um, Edmar Midness, although he did not beat Bobby Fischer in this particular tournament was one of those three individuals. So um, a very very strong US player um, and so this is one of my favorite games from Bobby Fischer's first ever US championship. Now in this game we do have Bobby Fischer playing the white pieces and we have Edmar Mendes playing the black pieces. So uh, as Bobby Fischer normally did, he started out with pawn to e4. Bobby Fischer liked to change things up but he did always uh, like to start with pawn to e4. In black, Edmar Mendes plays pawn to d6. Now this is the perk defense, so kind of just some background as far as what both sides are going to be going after. Uh, black pretty much is conceding the center of the board. White's going to be able to play pawn to d4, which is exactly what Bobby Fischer does. And this perk defense is a hypermodern defense, meaning that black early on is not going to push forward very hard with his pawns. Instead, he's going to try to from the outside, uh, try to control the center of the board with his minor pieces. So Fianchettoing his bishop to uh, g7, he could always Fianchetto his bishop to b7. Uh, really try to get his knights involved into the game, try to control the center of the board, and only once he has an attack that he thinks he can undermine white's position in the center, then and only then will he try to counterattack um, and then take over the center of the board. Obviously the center of the board is very, very important in chess, so at some time black definitely wants to have center control of the board. So early on Bobby Fischer does have the advantage with pawn to d4 and black's going to continue with the main line. Mendes plays knight to f6. Again hyper modern defense trying to control the center and attack with his minor pieces. Bobby Fischer white continues with knight to c3 and Mendes black pieces plays pawn to g6. Now what I really enjoy about studying games that Bobby Fischer played, especially early on, you know, this he's only 14, um, is he really starts to innovate a lot of the openings that we see today. That, uh, you know, for us, if we study it, it's book lines and even computer engines, if you look at them, they're book lines. But when Bobby Fischer played them, um, a lot of time he was theorizing what they should play, you know, how they should play, uh, some of the best moves in different variations. Um, his next move, bishop to g5, it definitely gets out his dark square bishop, which a lot of times is more difficult for white to get involved into the game. Uh, but this move really didn't become popular until the 60s. Robert Byrne actually um, introduced this a lot into the game as far as theory behind it. But Bobby Fischer, in his first ever U.S. championship, plays... Um, 
you know, a new move, which I'm sure he had studied very, very often, um, probably had a lot of theory behind it himself. It just wasn't widespread. So um, very interesting that even early on in his career, at the age of 14, he was already thinking about new ways of playing chess that other people really hadn't um, come to yet. So uh, from here, black's going to come to bishop 2g7, and white's going to play queen to d2. Again, supporting this uh, bishop here on g5. Um, also getting ready to castle on the queen side. Typically, any time you start to develop one of your minor pieces or your major pieces to one side, that's typically where you're going to castle. So if Bobby Fischer instead decided to start out with his knight to f3 and then get his light square bishop involved into the game, you would typically see white castle on the king side. But in this case, since Bobby Fischer decided to get his knight involved to c3, and then his dark square bishop and his minor, his, excuse me, his major piece here to d2. Uh, more than likely, Bobby Fischer, in this case, white's going to be castling on the queen side. Now from here, Mednis does have a few options. He could always try to bring his knight to c6. Simple development move, again, hypermodern, trying to control the center of the board with his minor pieces. He could even bring his knight to d7, as far as opening book theory. Uh, this is... This is okay nowadays that a lot of people have gone over this. Uh, knight to d7 does play fairly well. Black could also castle on the king side. Again, after he fiends his bishop to g7, uh, this is a very safe defense for Black. Um, and he does also have the option of kicking this bishop with pawn to h6. Now, this does come um, with a, a tidbit of information. Anytime you start to push up uh, pawns once you fiends your bishop, your, your king side does become a lot weaker. So in this case, the king side from black is much weaker. Um, so he's going to look to castle on the queen side if he does have that option. And he really wants to keep the queen side uh, much safer now since the king side, it, you know, is kind of pushing forward. This is not bad by any means, um, but it does weaken the king side. So something to keep along. We're going to kind of be going over the strengths and weaknesses of both the king side and the queen side. Um, but this is what Mednis plays. He plays pawn to h6 and it kicks back the bishop here to f4. Bobby Fischer again bringing his bishop back to f4 so he can put a lot of pressure on the center of the board. Still really trying to control the center of the board, um, but obviously he does need to retreat his bishop back. Uh, now black's going to play pawn to c6. Um, again from here, black does need to be careful. Now pawn to c6 does give him some options. Um, you know, later on he can bring his knight to d7. He does open up the window for his queen to come to a5 if he wants to. Um, and again, he's still looking to castle on the queen side. He's also blocking this b5 square, very important square. If white ever wanted to develop his minor pieces, his bishop, let's say, to b5, get that involved into the game. It is also, you know, defending the knight coming here to b5. It's definitely, um, you know, blocking this square here on b5. Now Bobby Fischer castles on the queen side as we had talked about before. Um, anytime you start to develop you do want to get your king to safety as soon as possible and black from here Mendes plays queen to a5 um, starting to attack on the queen side again anytime your opponent kind of shows their hand to you and tells you what side they're going to have their king on the rest of the game um, in some way you, you, you want to start to attack that uh, one way or another. It could be early on into the game or you could build an attack later on into the game. Uh, from here, Bobby Fischer is going to play king to b1 and you'll see this a lot. Obviously, Bobby Fischer does have the knight here on c3 defending this pawn on a1, but you never want to have your minor pieces tied down to a particular pawn or a particular square. Uh, your minor pieces really need to be controlling the center of the board, but later on you actually want them to be attacking and have your major pieces actually supporting those as well. So um, you really don't want to have this knight tied down to this pawn on a2, so the king just is going to come over to b1 and protect this pawn here on a2. Now from here, black's going to play pawn to g5, and I really like this because uh, you know, Black does have the opportunity to castle on the queen side later on, and he's really starting to make a push on on the king side here. Uh, there's not really a lot of options for the dark square bishop here um, for white, um, so really putting a lot of pressure on white here to do something productive. Now Bobby Fischer decides to retreat his bishop back to g3. 
And from here, Mednis plays knight to h5, looking to exchange off his knight for this dark square bishop here on g3. There's not really a lot of squares that Bobby Fischer can now move his bishop. Uh, so typically, you, you will see a trade-off here um, for the knight and the dark square bishop. Most times at high-level play, early on into the games, as, as you can open up the board very easily, a lot more easily than you can close the game, uh, bishops tend to fare better. A lot of people like a bishop pair, especially when they can open it up. So anytime a lot of, if a you know, a high-level chess player can trade off one of their knights for a bishop, you typically will see that early on. So if you're kind of curious why this knight's coming to h5 on the rim, you know, typically a knight on the rim is dim. Uh, but in this particular case, he's just going, you know, to trade off the, the knight here um, on g3. Uh, white plays bishop to c4. Uh, you know, a lot of players get bogged down. They say, you know what, I'm going to lose this bishop here on g3. I'm going to trade it off. Um, you know, what's really the best way to recapture? Um, and Bobby Fischer just, he realized that he's going to have to trade that off. So he, instead, um, really starts to focus on what his, you know, attack's going to be and really start to develop his pieces. One of the big things you always want to do in chess game is you want to develop your minor pieces and you want to develop them towards the center of the board. Uh, the c4 square is a very important square. It's attacking the f7 square from black, which is a huge weakness um, early on into the game. It's the only square from black that's only defended by the king. So no of the other, none of the other pieces um, can defend the pawn early on into the game. So huge weakness for black early on, this f7 square. And that's exactly where Bobby Fischer places his bishop here on c4, attacking this pawn here on f7. Uh, now from here, black plays an interesting move that I actually don't agree with. And he plays pawn to b5. Uh, now the problem that I have with this, is, and, and I'll kind of go over some different variations right here, is um, the king side from black is already weak. And that's okay if... The queen side is strong, and you can actually make a very strong push from the king side. The problem right here is Bobby Fischer has a very, very strong defense on the queen side for his king. Um, and so, if you look at black, where is his king really going to go? The king side is the king side is weak, and now he's kind of opened up his queen side here. Um, you know, I think it would have been a much better play if instead of bringing his you know pawn down to b5. If he tried something, you know, knight to d7, uh, looking to get that involved into the middle of the board, you know, if he wanted to later on, he could play uh, pawn to e5, really start to push forward. Again, trying to counterplay in the center of the board, try to take back the center of the board. A uh, very nice square from, from black right here on d7. Uh, but instead, you know, he, he kind of overextends. He plays pawn to b5. Uh, you know, seems logical trying to... to you know, kick off this bishop here on b4, um, but really does overextend himself. Now, uh, Bobby Fischer actually has two options here. If you study any amount of Bobby Fischer's play, um, he is he's so prone to just bring his bishop back to b3, um, still eyeing down on this f7 square, um, you know, trying to eye down on this long diagonal. Uh, Bobby Fischer actually made a mistake here, though. Um, he did have the opportunity to actually just capture here on b5. Now, as you can see, uh, the queen, there's a discovered attack on the queen here on a5. Um, so the queen can't come and capture on b5. Obviously, you know, white would recapture with his bishop. Um, and he can also not take with his pawn here on b5 uh, because again his queen is hanging here on a5 now if he does capture if he decides to capture right here and you say you know okay well you know Mednis could have now just taken the the knight here on uh, b5 uh, this would actually be incorrect play as well because Bobby Fischer could have now brought his bishop to d5 um, he would have taken this rook here on a8 there's no way to prevent this and white would be up a a lot of material in this situation. So, uh, you know, Bobby Fischer dead. He, he kind of let one go by here. Uh, he definitely could have gone up in material, but, uh, you know, he kind of played it safer route. He decided, you know, I'm going to bring my bishop back to b3. I have a much better foundation as far as, you know, protection for my king. Um, you know, he's probably played this situation many, many times before. And if he kind of looks at it, he really doesn't have to be... Um, 
you know, too aggressive. Black really is, is kind of digging, digging his own grave in the situation. He's kind of overextending all his pawns without really doing too much damage to uh, Bobby Fischer's um, entire structure. Um, so, you know, he, he chose a safe route and just played bishop to b3. Now, after the bishop comes back to b3, Mednis now brings his knight to d7. Definitely a good square. Uh, he needs to get his knight involved into the action. Bobby Fischer is almost complete as far as his development. He does need to get this knight involved into the game. And then he will correct, connect his rooks. A lot of time, you'll, as far as uh, you know, completing development, you'll hear that. You'll get all your minor pieces involved into the game. Um, get out your queen, castle on one side, and then connect your rooks. You definitely want your rex, rooks connected into the game. Uh, they have a lot more mobility, and they definitely work well together. So, um, you know, knight to d7. Black's really looking to castle on the queen side here. Again, his king side is getting, you know, very, very extended. Um, but, you know, again, his queen side is as well. Bobby Fischer now plays pawn to f4. He starts to attack on the king side. Uh, just to make sure, trying to figure out exactly where Mednis is going to castle. Um, he does still have the option to castle on the king side if he wants to. Uh, but this f4 is a very aggressive move, trying to push forward controlling this in the board um, and really making sure uh, that black kind of shows his hand as far as what he's going to do because if he gets rid of this pawn here on g5 it's going to be very difficult to castle on the king side because there's going to be a semi-open file on the g file uh, from here black plays knight takes on g3 uh, i think it might have been a little better move to actually play pawn to b4 again if you're going to push on the queen side you can't do it half-hearted. You, you kind of have to go all in here. Um, you know, pushing pawn to b4, making this knight go somewhere. Obviously, it can't come here to d5. It would lose material. Um, you know, it would have to have a passive move like, you know, knight to e2. So um, definitely putting a lot of pressure on white. Um, but instead, you know, he does the exchange that Bobby Fischer has kind of been waiting for for a few moves. And he takes there on g3, and white recaptures with his pawn on g3, opening up this semi-open file um, for the rook here on h1. Now black pushes forward with his pawn to g4. Um, interesting move, really trying to solidify these double pawns here on g4 and g3. Um, again, I think instead of you know pushing forward to g4, um, I, I think it probably would have been a good move for Black to continue the pressure to play pawn to b4. Um, he kind of has this um, you know possibility to play for a long time, and he just really never takes advantage of it. But um, instead, he does play pawn to g4, and then Bobby Fischer pushes forward with pawn to e5. If you kind of look at the board, Bobby Fischer. Um, really has, uh, both sides are equal in material, um, but Bobby Fischer has a very, very strong defense in front of his king, and he can really start to attack the center of the board. Um, both the queen side and the king side for black are, are kind of weak, um, so if you kind of have weaknesses on both sides, Bobby Fischer just decides that he's going to attack the middle, and one of the sides is going to crumble. Uh, one of the sides is going to have to kind of, you know, counterattack um, with all their minor pieces and pawns and so he's going to be able to either attack on the queen side or the king side so um, from here black decided to play pawn to d5 now i do think he did have um, some other options here instead of you know d6 again as we talked about he does have this pawn to b4 move um, if he wants to but instead you know he plays pawn to d5 Bobby Fischer plays pawn to f5, again, really putting pressure on the center of the board and just pushing up his pawns. His pawns are being supported um, you know, by each other. If he wants to, he can always bring his rooks involved into the game to kind of support from the back. Um, so he's just kind of pushing forward, putting a lot of pressure on black. Black starting to really um, lose a lot of space here. There's not a lot of great squares for him to go. His queen over here on a5 is kind of hanging out on its own. Um, it's really hard for black right now to strategize where he's going to go next. Mendes in this situation decides to bring his knight to b6, really eyeing down on his outpost on c4 if he wants to. Um, anytime there's an exchange here, um, he can open up this b file, really opening up a strong attack on the on the queen side. Uh, so that's kind of what Mendes is looking for in this situation. Um, but instead, you know, White looks at this and sees kind of a, a lot of the material from black is shifted towards the queen side. Uh, 
Fisher feels pretty confident that his king is safe. Uh, so he plays queen to f4. Um, really eyeing down on this pawn to g4. And Bobby Fisher, you know, really is just looking for pawn to come to h5. That's really all he wants. Uh, right now, the bishop here on g7 is defending this pawn on h6. So really, Bobby Fisher is just bringing his queen to f4 um, to kind of draw this pawn out, kind of overextend it even more so that he can put a lot of pressure on it later on into the game. Uh, but instead, Menace plays an interesting move, which, which I'm going to consider a blunder. Um, you know, the computer actually considers it a blunder as well, simply because he just gives up material, and he plays pawn to e6. Definitely one of the significant pitfalls into the game, um, because he's just giving up this pawn on g4. Really not what you want to do against Bobby Fischer, just give up material for absolutely no reason. Um, you know, again, he could have always pushed forward with b4. We've talked about this before. Um, but instead, he plays e6, and Bobby Fischer is going to take this material right here. Uh, you have to do keep in mind that Bobby Fischer is now attacking Menace's bishop here on g7. So the bishop will have to move, and the bishop's going to come back to f8. And then Bobby Fischer is going to take with his pawn on e6. And then black has to recapture with his bishop. Now, if you look at it and you say, you know, why doesn't he capture with his pawn? Well, if he does capture with his pawn, uh, then white can just bring his queen to g6. And then black's in a whole lot of trouble. Black can no longer castle because he's going to have to move his king. Um, black is down in material. And, you know, Bobby Fischer can always bring his knight, or excuse me, his rook over to the f file. Um, and just start to put a lot of pressure on the black king. Um, this rook here on a8 would never get involved into the action. So it would definitely be really, really hard for black to defend here. So um, he does make the correct choice, and he recaptures with his bishop here on e6. But um, as you can kind of tell, this bishop is kind of tied down to this pawn here on f7, and also supporting this pawn here on d5. But uh, he does capture with tempo. The white queen from Bobby Fischer is going to have to move back. And he moves back to queen to f3. Now Mednis decides it's now time to castle. So he castles on the queen side. Um, you know, again, if you kind of look at it, although he castled on the queen side, the queen side is still very, very vulnerable. Um, his, all of his pawns are, are kind of extended very quickly. So Bobby Fischer, if you kind of look at kind of what side, what both sides need to do in this situation, uh, it's always good anytime you approach a chess situation is kind of look what what material both sides, kind of who's winning in material, but also who's winning as far as development, whose king is safe, whose king isn't safe, whose pieces are actually doing something, whose are kind of tied back. It's not always about um, you know how many people you have in the army, it's about how many people in the army are actually fighting. So if all your pieces are tied up, that's not as important if you have, you know, four or five pieces actually fighting in the battle. So if we kind of look at this, uh, Bobby Fischer has a good thing going for him. Um, although his light square bishop here isn't doing too much, his king is very, very protected. Um, and as you can see, you know, black, is, his king side is not protected. Um, it's kind of discombobulated right now. Um, it's going to be very, very easy for him to just, you know, protect his king on the queen side um, and kind of make room and attack on the king side and eventually make his way over and attack the king here on c8. So from here, white plays knight to h3. Again, he does need to get his minor pieces involved into the game. He is yet to move his knight to h3. And one thing that Bobby Fischer does better than anyone I've ever seen play chess is he really uses all of his pieces together very, very well. Anytime, you know, a lot of times people will, will play a piece or they'll, they'll move one of their minor pieces, um, and it's for one particular goal. But Bobby Fischer typically is moving his pieces for multiple roles and goals. Typically, he wants all of his pieces to be cohesive and work together. So um, first thing he needs to do is get his knight involved into the game to h3. Black's going to now bring his rook to g8. Anytime there is a semi-open file, which this g file is, you definitely want your rook on that file. So um, definitely putting a lot of pressure on this file right here. Bobby Fischer is always going to have to be looking at that with his queen or another one of his minor or major pieces, um, or else he will be giving back that pawn that he got early on into the game. 
So from here, Bobby Fischer just brings his white queen back to f2, and Mednis decides to go ahead and bring his knight to c4. Again, as we talked about, looking to exchange and then open up this b file uh, for one of his rooks or some of his other pieces right now. Now, Bobby Fischer, we look at this white bishop right here on b3 is not doing anything, and it's probably not going to be doing anything for a while. So uh, white in this situation decides to go ahead and trade off, and black recaptures, recapturing towards the center, uh, typically a good thing in chess, uh, getting ready to eye down on this b file right. Now, the next few moves from white actually take the advantage that he does have, um, and kind of brings it back to equality as far as both sides. Um, you know, if we kind of look at it, Bobby Fischer could easily play knight to f4. Start to really put a lot of pressure on black. Uh, really start to push up on the king side. Uh, for right now, his king side, or excuse me, his queen side is safe, uh, defending the, the king here. Um, but again, you know, Bobby Fischer being 14, this is his first U.S. championship, you know, my guess is nerves probably kind of got to him. He started to play a little bit passive. Um, Black actually started to, um, you know, have this big attack start to come up on the queen side. Um, so next couple moves, Bobby Fischer starts to play a little bit passive. It doesn't actually start to attack um, when he probably should have. So Bobby Fischer in this particular place plays king to a one. And black comes to d7, getting ready to bring his rook over to the b7 square, um, and then really start to attack on the queen side um, of white here. Bobby Fischer now plays knight to b1. Again, a very, very passive move. He still could have brought his knight over to f4 if he wanted to, and start to put a lot of pressure on black here. Uh, definitely a passive move, and this kind of brought it back uh, near equality. White still has a, a small advantage, um, but black definitely has a strong attack coming up. From here, black decided to bring his rook over to b7 as we talked about. Anytime there's a semi-open file, as this b file is, you definitely want to attack that, and you want to have your rook there, especially um, with the opponent's queen on the a excuse me, the king on the a1 square, uh, definitely targeting all your major and minor pieces on that. It's definitely going to be a good thing. Now, Bobby Fischer now plays pawn to c3, uh, really allowing this queen here on f2 um, to defend the pawn here on b2, and also defending this key square on b4. Uh, black does have this dark square bishop that can always come into the game if you wanted to, um, and really just defending a lot of the dark squares. This pawn from c3, actually a very, very good move from white. Now, black does play an interesting move right here. I, I think it kind of wastes some time. He definitely does have some different options, um, but he plays rook to b6. Now, if you kind of look at this, it doesn't really improve his position. Um, you know, he was kind of attacking the same thing. He was still, you know, has his rook on this semi-open b file. Really, what he should have done is he needs to protect his king. Uh, right now, he needs to get his king on a dark square. It's going to be very, very hard to um, attack that dark square um, if he does bring his king over to, let's say, b8. Um, at any given time, if white were to take this bishop off of the e6 square, uh, then the queen could always come to, let's say, f5 or um, you know g4 later on and attack these light squares. But if he has it on b8, then his king is pretty much safe. He could always, if he wanted to, bring it over to a8. It would be extremely safe. But as you can see, he's really starting a huge attack against the queen side of white. White's kind of being passive right now, kind of allowing black to do all this. Uh, but instead, he kind of wastes a move. He plays rook to b6. Doesn't really improve anything. Kind of the same situations we talked about. Um, you know, he really wasn't thinking about his king at all. Anytime you have a position, whether it's yourself or it's the U.S. Championship, always think about what your objective is um, and what you need to do that. And don't waste moves. This pawn, this, excuse me, this rook from b7 uh, to b6 um, definitely could have been doing a lot more efficient things with, with his moves. Uh, now, white plays rook to d2. Again, Putting a lot of defense on this pawn to b2. Uh, he probably doesn't need all this defense, but 
Again, Bobby Fischer is still up in material, so he's probably just trying to hold on to that, trying to make sure that Black doesn't sneak in for any crazy attacks here. Now, Black makes a huge blunder right here. Instead of going away from any potential attacks, he actually brings his king closer to any potential attacks with king to d7. Now, he's probably thinking that he wants to get his dark square bishop involved into the game, and then he wants to swing his rook over into the action to the b-file to support his other rook. Um, while that's all, you know, good, it would have been much better if he would have brought his, you know, king over to b8 and then a8. It would have been much, much harder um, for white to actually, you know, get over and attack that king. You never want to bring your king into the middle of the game um, when your opponent has all of his major pieces and two of his minor pieces. Now, once you reach towards the end game, the queens are off the board. Um, you know, there's not all the minor pieces and both the rooks on the board. Then you actually want to bring your king into the game. He's actually a huge... Um, asset to your attack, bring him into the center of the game. But when your opponent has all these attacking pieces, the center of the board is not where you want your king. You actually want him protected in a corner somewhere, just hiding out, hoping that your opponent does not attack you. Now, if there's one thing that Bobby Fischer does well, it's he smells weakness and he attacks weakness. So he realizes that black has made a blunder here. He's brought his king closer to the action, um, and so he's going to attack that weakness. So Bobby Fischer now plays knight to f4. This is kind of the attack on the king side he's been waiting for. Um, he now has you know a strong defense with his king here on a1. He's kind of tucked in this corner. And he's now going to start to attack. Um, Black decides to bring his bishop to e7. Uh, if we kind of look at it with this exchange here, let's let's just move the pawn here to a6. After the exchange here, um, you know the king could always come here to e6 and kind of become more out in the open. Uh, but if the pawn takes here on e6, then the queen could come up here to f7, check the king, and then win this rook here um, on g8. So uh, definitely wants to make sure that he can't just come up to f7 and check. So one of the ways that he can do this is to early on uh, bring his bishop to e7. So that's exactly what he does here. And then Bobby Fischer takes this pawn here on h6. So um, you know this bishop here on f8 was protecting this pawn here on h6 but no longer so Bobby Fischer comes in and takes this also has a strong attack he now has another major piece involved into the game and again black has his king into the center of the board now black's going to play rook to f8 trying to control and protect this pawn here on f7 and Bobby Fischer is going to play queen to f3 he really wants to make sure that his queen is on light squares anytime he's going to exchange off uh, let's say with this bishop here on e6 he definitely wants his queen on a light square so if he wants to he can get involved into the action and attack at any given time with his queen here on f2 it's kind of passive it's not doing a whole lot it's going to take a few moves for him to get involved into the action so he plays queen to f3 Again, Bobby Fischer's queen side is safe, so all he's doing is trying to meticulously bring all of his pieces together on the queen, excuse me, on the king side, um, and mount an attack. So from here, Black plays rook to a6, um, you know, trying to come up with some attack on the uh, queen side, attacking the white queen. Excuse me, the white king, but all white has to do is play pawn to a3, and this pretty much just thwarts any attack that black has. Uh, he does have the pawn that's protecting this, he also has the knight here that can also defend the square on a3. Black is now going to bring his rook over to b8, again trying to uh, try to find some way to attack, but this rook here on b8 is not doing a whole lot. Um, it is attacking this pawn here on b2, um, but too little too late. Bobby Fischer's now going to take with his knight on e6. And after the exchange, the king can't come right now to e6 because of the rook there on h6. So he's going to take with his pawn here. And then Bobby Fischer's actually going to sacrifice his rook here 
on e6. As Bobby Fischer does, again, anytime he smells blood or weakness, he's going to attack that. So he's willing to give up this rook here on e6. Now, uh, just to kind of go over the variation, you know, hey, Kevin, why can't he just take that? Uh, definitely want to show you guys that if he does take the rook here on e6, um, then Bobby Fischer can just play uh, white to you know, queen to g4 here. The only possible move, we can't come to d6. Uh, Midness can't come back to d7. He can't come to f6. His only move is king to f7. Uh, Bobby Fischer can now play pawn to e6. And now Midness has two options. He can bring his uh, king to e8 if he wants to, or he can also bring his king to f8. Um, e8 is actually going to lose quicker, so we'll kind of go over that variation. If Midness plays king to e8, then after the queen to g8, the bishop has to defend, um, and then it's checkmate for Bobby Fischer. Now if he does move, um, Midness does play king to f8, then all Bobby Fischer has to come in and play queen to g6, and there is absolutely no stopping the queen coming to f7 for checkmate. Now, um, you know, Midness could have, if he wanted to, kind of, you know, slow up the game. He could have come down and captured, and then after the capture, recapture, and then he takes. He could have even brought his rook down to b1 if he wanted to. After all the captures are done, and kind of Midness is given all the opportunities to delay the game, um, you know, it's still inevitable. No one can stop the queen coming to f7. So, um, if you're kind of curious, you know, Bobby Fischer is giving up that rook. Why can't the king just take that? Uh, that is the exact reason. So um, I think in this particular case, Midness actually gets more flustered um, because he makes an even worse move. So in this particular case, Black probably should have tried to bring his queen involved into the action, you know, maybe queen to d8. He needs to protect, um, you know, his bishop there on e7, um, but he also needs to have a defender. He needs to realize that his attack against the queen against the white king is not going anywhere. There's actually not enough pieces coordinated correctly to do an attack. Um, so he needs to come up with a better idea. Queen to d8 is a better idea here. But um, instead, he plays bishop takes on a3, and Bobby Fischer recaptures with his knight. Again, there's no great move for uh, Midness to play in this situation. Uh, the king is now going to capture with his king here on e6, um, and that's pretty much good game from here. Bobby Fischer plays uh, queen to g4, uh, the king's going to come back to e7, and Bobby Fischer plays rook to f2, getting ready to come involved into the game. Um, you know, again, Black's just kind of wishing that something could happen on the queen side, but it doesn't, so a few more moves. Uh, comes Brings his rook over to e8, which really doesn't do anything productive, um, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, Bobby Fischer now white plays queen to g5 check. The king goes back to d7. Um, you know, continue with the moves right here. White plays f5 check. King goes over to b8. White plays d7, and black in this situation actually resigned. There's no way to stop Bobby Fischer coming um, to b7 checkmate. Now, you know, Midness, if he wanted to, could have always delayed the game. He could have brought his queen involved into the game. He could have, if he wanted to, even, you know, taken this knight and then taken it with his rook if he wanted to. But, um, you know, in this situation, he decided to just go ahead and resign. So, a uh, very, very exciting game from a 14-year-old kid. His first ever U.S. championship to come in, um, play someone six years older than him, and to win um, his very first U.S. championship. Very, very exciting. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope you learned something as far as um, looking at different positions and thinking about what both sides can do, um, different ideas that they can do and attack, uh, defending your own king, and then focusing on other sides of the board or weaknesses that you see your opponent have. So uh, definitely leave comments. Let me go. Let me know what you guys think about it. Also, if you have any questions for the graphic novel, it's going to be um, coming out in the future, but it's going to be pretty awesome. Again, Bobby Fischer, the knight who killed the king. So um, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you all in part three.